as some of you may know, I've, I'm working on um, a self-paced version video course of my live course for factoring to hexagonal architecture. Um, and it's been very slow going because uh, I realized that, well, A, I'm a perfectionist, um, and B, um, related to that, it's very different to create a course um, where I've tended to rely on conversation and discussion to teach the class. Um, and that's very different, even though I do a fair amount of lecture in the, in the class anyway, uh, converting that to a self-paced course where I feel like uh, I'm doing good explanations and can't rely on people to say, hey, what did you mean by X uh, as much? So that's that's been taking me a long time. Um, and so one of the things that that I want to do is have multiple examples of hexagonal architected, basically hexagonal architecture structured code, because um, I think uh, examples are really important um, for for learning this stuff. Uh, I know I learned from examples in addition to actually just trying things out and doing them. Um, I learned a lot from from examples, and uh, yeah, so. What I want to do today, which is not work on my mob registration system or, or other stuff, um, what I want to work on today is basically uh, TDDing. And by the way, this is my my new hat. Uh, this is the red hat. So this is uh, the red part of the the TDD cycle. I've got my uh, refactor part of the cycle. So maybe I'll switch hats. Um, it's so weird. So the weather was like really hot earlier this week and last week and now it's like uh, now i'm actually chilly and it's like not even barely barely 60 degrees fahrenheit so hey sweetie so um yeah so let's get to it so the uh thing i want to work on is basically just from scratch um what does it look like to, to TDD an application with hexagonal architecture? It's been a while since I've done it. The last time I did this was... Actually, I don't know. I think it was the Yacht Dice Game, which was at least a couple of years ago. Uh, does the Red Hat work on kids to change their behavior? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, so let's switch to, you can tell I'm out of practice because I'm like, where's the button? There it is. Okay. Um, so this is, uh, there's a whole bunch of variants on this one. This one was originally uh, um, a kata. I don't use the word kata. Um, there's a little bit of a sense of cultural appropriation. Some people don't feel strongly about it. And I'm like, you know, but I, I want to respect what that is and that, that culture. So I try to shift things to, to use the word exercise. Um, but this actually comes from uh, um, Prag Dave, one of the pragmatic programmers, uh, Dave Thomas, um, who wrote, wrote it up as part of a series on, on doing these kinds of exercises. Um, I'm sure people have done variants of this earlier, but this is the one that a lot of people reference. Uh, and so I basically took one that was done by um, uh, these folks, Serenity, Serenity Dojo. Um, so I took theirs and basically updated it and moved some things around. And uh, and it's sort of like, this is one of those things where it's like, it doesn't really matter what it is, as long as there's something non-trivial in terms of what it's doing. Uh, and so here we've got the Supermerge could check out pricer. So the idea is to, to build, um, you know, sort of the thing that, that calculates the pricing of stuff you've got in your cart at, at a supermarket where it gets tricky is, is basically the special deals. So we'll figure out which deals we want to, uh, um, incorporate. Uh, and so I set this up sort of. Um, so you can start with, with this story, right? Given a toothbrush product that has a price of a dollar, when you add it to your cart and you ask the cart how much things cost, it should return a dollar. Um, so 
we'll start with um, how do we, you know, so the questions that, that you want to think about is what is the first test that we write? And so this goes back to my, um, I should probably bring this up. Let's see. Uh, no, that's not it. Do I have it open? No, let's open it. Do you have to do testables? Test development. Why are you taking so long? It's always scary when it takes a long time to open up a file. There we go. Uh, so this, um, so this, the TDD cycle that I'll be following uh, is basically this based on um, how I teach it. So this game, TDD.cards, if you go there, uh, you can you can purchase the digital version of the game. So we first want to figure out what should it do and how do we know it. Um, but a lot of times it's like, well, what's the first test I should, I, t I should write, right? So if I want to get to here, um, what you can do is you can say, well, I, I don't know where necessarily where I want to start, uh, beyond this. And so the first test you might think of is, um, you know, if a card has a, a toothbrush, but that's too many new elements. And so when I'm thinking about the first test I'm, I want to write, I'm thinking about what are the fewest number of elements I can get away with. And so something that helps is um, basically uh, James Grenning's Zombies, which uh, the ZOM basically is zero one many. So you think about, okay, what's the baseline test? What's the zero case? Because uh, what we're what I try to do when when I'm starting out is I want to build start building some of the these objects, and so the first thing we want to probably build is a thing we'll call a cart. Um, could call it a bag, call it something else, but we'll use cart. Um, and we just want to try to get this object created. What's the minimal thing we could assert about it that will basically force the, the object to be, to come into existence, as well as um, what is the price of an empty cart? So we use this as a foundation then to build on when we add stuff to the cart, right? That that uh, is calculated correctly. Uh, do I use the display name annotation? No, I don't. I rely on my test method names to, to be useful. Um, I, I don't... I honestly don't understand why people use display name. Um, I know they have good reasons, but for me, I'm like, why not just make the method name descriptive? I, I don't know. Maybe you can tell me if there's a good reason that I'm, I'm overlooking, but I've looked at places where they use it. And I'm like, okay, that's slightly more readable maybe because you've got spaces in it. But you know, one of the things we're good at is, is, you know, especially in Java, we're good at reading camel case. Uh, words and, and use the words as uh, the delimiters. So here, one of the things that we've got is we we want of course want to start with a failing test, right? I've got my red cap on, um, and so this will fail because we've got the literal fail message. So we can we can take that out. Uh, and we can actually write a more a test that has actually some some stuff in it. Um, but right now it's failing because it's failing to compile, right? So that's the the first step. Right is okay. We know what it should do, and how do we know it did it? Basically, we know that we should be able to create a cart, and that it should not be null. Um, so that's that answers those questions. Uh, and now we want to write code for the test, and it'll comp it'll fail to compile because things don't exist. Uh, so now we want to write enough code to get it to compile. So that means we'll have to create the class. So we'll go ahead and create the class. Um, it goes into our domain, uh, our production code. Um, and the layout that I like for, um, sort of adopted this from doing a lot of ensembles, uh, and I, and I really like it is, uh, having both the test and the code on the same screen where the test is on the left. So you get the sense of, of the test driving, uh, the, the, the creation of the code. 
So now we've got the class. Don't put anything in it. Um, this test uh, should now pass. Um, so even though there wasn't, we didn't really see the test failing. It was failing due to, to compile, but we'll we'll change this. And so this is um, a technique that uh, instead of writing sort of always new tests, I'll sometimes write a, a test that asserts less than I eventually wanted to as a stepping stone. So I expect, assuming my compiler works, assuming my, my test framework works, this, um, this should now pass, and it does. So now I can say, well, asserting that it's not null, that's not good enough. Really, I want to assert something about the state, uh, the information from the cart. I'd like to do something like, what is the current total price of the cart? So let's ask it that question. So we want to ask total price. No, it's not get total price. It is total price. It is a query method. We're asking the cart, what is your current total price? We are not getting, so get to me has implications of getting some internal state. That's not what we're doing. What we're doing is we're querying the object. How it knows the current price, the total price of its stuff, we don't know, and we don't care. And we don't want to care. There may not actually be an instance variable, a field called total price. In fact, my implementation probably won't go that way. So what we're going to say is, uh, well, as soon as this doesn't compile, we want to make a compile because this will help us use the autocomplete for our assertions. So we'll create the method. Now we have to decide what is it going to return. For now, I'm going to use whole dollars. Um, but that's going to quickly change once we get into some of the discount stuff. But we'll start with whole dollars. So I'm going to use an int. Now, I don't want to return zero because the test I'm about to write is going to be assert that, that it's zero, and that'll pass. So I don't want it to pass. So there are a couple of things you can do. You can throw an unsupported operation exception. That'll definitely fail the test. Um, or you could return some out of range number like negative one. But for situations like this, I kind of prefer to throw throw an exception. So now that we have the method and, and its return value is defined, uh, the return type is defined, we can now say um, is zero. So not, we don't have to say is equal to zero, we can just say is zero, because it uh, assert j gives us uh, that kind of assertion. So now, um, right, we're in the changing behavior, right, the red. So our prediction is that this is going to fail. So one of the important parts about both my, my game and the process um, is uh, the prediction, right? So we want to predict that uh, the test must fail and for the right reason. So our expectation is this is going to fail. And at this point, again, it's very easy to, to see how it's going to fail. It's going to fail because we're going to throw an unsupported operation exception. If somehow we were calling the wrong method, who knows? Yeah, Suiji, I've seen your, your automated snippet that does that. All right, so it throws an exception. So fails as expected. And so now our goal is to get this to pass with the least amount of code possible. And of course, the least amount of code possible is we return zero. Now it should pass. And now, there we go. Now we can refactor. Um, so when we refactor, one of the things we look for is uh, duplication. The other thing I look for are our constants, especially in this case where, look, I know I'm going to return something other than zero, except at this point, I don't know that a field is the right thing to do. So it'd be tempting to say, oh, let me go and refactor to a field that will be called, you know, total price. Um, but I have no, I have nothing that really tells me that that's the next step. So to do that would be premature. So let's leave it at zero and let's figure out what the next test is. Um, 
So let's actually, uh, I'm going to go on a branch. Let's check out, and we'll call this, uh, Oops. And what did that? And let's hide that. So our first story that we want to implement, so remember that test-driven development doesn't work at the granularity of stories. That tells you when you can move on to something else, and it should also be a trigger for doing more thoughtful deeper refactorings um but this is uh needs to be broken down to steps which we've done the first one of which is just establish the baseline that way when we create a cart its total price is zero but we want to head towards towards this which means we're gonna um want to add a product well so that means we're gonna need to create some kind of product now it might be tempting to go ahead and create another class, but I don't know what that class looks like. So I'm gonna, you know, I can probably guess and maybe on experience I can do that. Um, but at this point, I, I don't know what that needs, which means um, I'm gonna need to write another test. So we're back to sort of changing behavior and I won't switch my hats all the time. That's gonna, it would get annoying. Um, so now we're back at what is the next piece of behavior that we want? So the next piece of behavior we want is add toothbrush product, then cart price is one dollar. Total price is one dollar. So what do I want it to do? I want it when there's a cart, when I add, right? And so this goes very much to this story, right? Give me a toothbrush product that is a price of a dollar. When toothbrush is added to the cart, querying the cart store price returns a dollar. So I'm going to create a cart. And now I want to add a, add a product. So add and here's where, again, I might think of, well, let me create a product object, except I don't need to do that. Um, I can basically say this is a toothbrush and its price is a dollar. And a functor zero. Yeah. And and so I might normally, you know, typically I'm, I might take a larger step because I have a sense, you know, we always have a sense of like, oh, there's probably a product object and it has a description and it has a cost. Um, but when we're sort of practicing TDD and taking small steps, we want to really take small steps. And my preference in general is, and this is my preference, not, not everybody does this, uh, but my preference is to extract objects from code that already exists. Somehow that feels more natural for me. Um, Sometimes I'll jump and create a class, but uh, I really do, I don't know, maybe it's, it's I, I really like refactoring. And so creating a, uh, an object, a class definition out of existing working code uh, is somehow more fun. I don't know. So <clears throat> we need to create this, this add. So we'll create it. Um, it takes a string, which we'll call uh, product name, and int we'll call uh, product cost or price and that's it right I don't need to do anything else to get it to compile and so now we can do an assertion assertion um, so what are what's our expectation is that when we ask the cart for its total price it should equal one well certainly if we run this it's gonna fail how is it going to fail? Well, add is basically a no op, and so it should still be zero. And we can even see that. We can inspect the code and say it's literally returning zero. So one should not be equal to zero. That's our expectation. Hey, Luxlers. Um, 
So fails as expected. <clears throat> so now our job is to make a pass. Uh, and... We want to write the least amount of code to do that. So that means this zero is not going to work, right? So the next level up in complexity from uh, a constant literal, I guess literals are by def definition constant, um, is some either an if statement or storing something that is uh, a piece of mutable data, like a field. Um, The other thing is, right, so if I wanted to return one, right, that would get the test to pass, but the other test would fail. Right, so that's clearly not going to work. But one of the things I, I, I watch out for, and, and uh, Kent Be Beck talks about, you know, duplication and the uh, and sort of design aspects, and one of them is, is you know, eliminating uh, duplication. Um, and so I kind of see this one as, as a duplication, right? Because it's actually over over here. And in fact, that one is then being passed into the product price. And so I can think, okay, well, if I just save that, right, do this sort of the simplest analysis, well, it's being passed in here. If I can just save this product price, then I can just return that, that value. And that should work for both tests. So, now I can I can do a refactoring and create a field. So I'm going to do a refactoring even though I've got a failing test. I, I know which which test is failing. But to be really sure, I'm going to basically comment out this test. And now I should be back at passing. Except I'm not because I didn't change this back to zero. So that's the danger of leaving a test failing, even though it's like, I know this test fails, right? Is that you may have unintentionally left something broken. So now we should be at passing. And so now I can refactor. And so now I can put a, a name to this thing. It's not total price because I want to copy this product price. So I'm just going to say product price. So this is exactly the same code. Test passes. And now I can uncomment the test. This should fail in the same way. One is not zero. But now I can do an assignment. I can say this dot product price equals product price. This should get the test to pass. And it does. And I created the branch because I meant to do a commit earlier, but I didn't. So let me do a commit now. So now we've got two passing tests. Oh. Okay. So we have um, achieved our first story, right? Ship it, right? Uh, not quite, of course, because this puts a lot of burden on the caller to pass in all of this detailed information. However, that may be okay, right? So one of the, the, the downsides of starting at this level, right? So if we think about what kind of code this is, this is pure domain code, right? This is all about what are the rules, process, calculations, behavior we want from the problem we're trying to solve, which is something that can give us the price of a cart with a bunch of items in it. So let's make that clear by doing a refactor. This object is a domain object. So I'm going to sort of switch gears here and, and think about this from a hexagonal architecture point of view. Uh, not, not that, this. Right, so the, the code we're working on is in here. 
completely isolated from the from the outside world. And um, but what gets hard is if we start here, we don't quite know. Well, how is like the web UI gonna gonna use this? Or how you know we could certainly order stuff through through text messages. Who knows? Um, we don't quite know what it's going to do. We also, what we don't know is this orange is the application layer. It's the one that's implementing these use cases. And so where does the product come from? Where does the product information come from? So it might be represented in our core domain as an object, as a domain object, but where does it come from? And so to me, the this is what I, I, I really love about hexagon architectures. You know exactly where it comes from. It comes from outside of the hexagon, right? So this yellow line here, that's the boundary of the hexagon. Everything inside of it is pure business, pure application. Meaning it has nothing to do with technical stuff or the outside world. But we do retrieve stuff from the outside world. So there may be persistence. Maybe there's a database that has the product information. Or maybe it's an external service completely that we have to communicate with over HTTP. But it comes from outside. So let's move this to where it belongs. So let's put this in a package that we'll call domain. And since we've done that, let's move our test class as well. Ah. I always forget the keyboard shortcut to optimize imports because I do it so infrequently. Um, so now, now we're now we're talking in the the domain, which um, oh I have to update that nightbot. I pushed back the the launch of of my course to to next month, um, but I think I'm on track for that. Uh, and welcome, Arvo. Right. Uh, um, so one of the things that that to me. Um, no, the hexagonal architecture course is, is, so if you sign up at the email list, you'll get details on, on the course, among other things. And so this is another example that I'm going to supply in the, in the course. So adding domain to me does, does these magical things. Um, one is it all of a sudden says no code here can reference anything hardware IO outside world related. The other thing it also triggers is strings are suspicious because we're inside the domain. So everything should be domain objects, value objects, right? So they should all be objects. So product name being just a string is, is a bit suspicious. Of course, we're not actually using it yet because we had no tests to do it. And in fact, maybe, you know, writing this, we weren't able to fully verify what we needed, but we said that that was part of the given. So I'm, I'm fine with, with that. But now we sort of magically put a barrier around uh, the code that, that we're looking at and it automatically triggers, this is not right. And uh, that's something that we would want to think about that we're missing some domain aspect. And so I went down this path because this API, right? A lot of people think about APIs as just having to do with web APIs, but API is just a programming interface. It's basically what methods are publicly available that you can call. And so cart has an add method. It takes two pieces of information, but is that the API we want? We're inside of our domain. And so we should really be thinking about domain objects. We should be thinking about product something that represents the product. The other thing we can do is we can sort of see this as a little bit of a code smell, right? Why are we passing in these two things? Shouldn't there be some kind of parameter object? Only two parameters doesn't, doesn't really trigger that, but it's, it's another piece of evidence. And so now I'd say maybe it's time to 
think about uh, an object that represents these two pieces of information. Because again, where does this come from? It comes from the application layer. And so the application layer, there might be a method called add to the cart this product name with this product price. But at, at this level, we should be generally talking already in domain objects. And so that's because the application layer is the one that loads information from external systems, including from databases, and then sends the sends that and coordinates that uh, and sends it into the to the core domain. Uh, that's a good point, Suiji. Having the having the product uh, as the prefix for the variable name for, for both of them is is certainly uh, indicating that there that there's a problem there. Uh, so Joshua Oliver Olivier, uh, this is um, not a great place to ask that kind of question, but somebody might be able to help you with that. I don't know JavaScript that well. Um, so the, you know, so now the question is like, is this yet the, is this a time to create, uh, the product object? I still don't quite know enough. There's also, I'm really like, what's going on with this product name? So I kind of feel like I need something to help me figure that out. And I don't know what that is yet. Do I even need the name? Maybe they're only toothbrushes. Maybe this is a toothbrush store. I don't know. Hey, Tiny Rose. Yeah, no, Jay has got not, not even. Um, so I don't have enough information to know what, where to refactor, right? So even though like I know a lot about refactoring, it doesn't mean that you can always refactor unless you have sort of enough evidence and data and, and information about what, what does that thing look like? And so I think I'm going to, at this point say, I, I don't know what that looks like. I have a guess, but I don't quite know what it, what it needs, right? So what's going to be in it? Where does it come from? What type of object is it? Do I even need product name? I don't, I don't have that. And so I can look back and say, okay, I basically got this first story. Um, the next story that I could follow up with is more about, you know, discounting, but a slightly different direction you can go in is, well, one of like, it's great to be able to find out the total price, but customers often want some kind of receipt or some kind of running tally of here's how much you have. And in order to create that, right, there's going to be, um, there's going to be some kind of receipt printing or some kind of, uh, thing that's going to show both the price of each item, but also the description of each item. And so when I get there, that, that might help me in, in figuring out some of that. But let's, let's, um, let's implement this one and then we'll, we'll move towards, okay, now that we have multiple products, uh, what happens then? So there's, we can't go directly to this because this is now about, um, figuring out, uh, the, the deal, right? buy toothbrushes, two toothbrushes, and get, get one half off. We haven't done the many case, right? So going back to the zombies, we haven't done the, the many case, right? If we look at our, our test, we've done the zero case, an empty cart, we've done the one case where we add one. So we really kind of do need to do the many case. So let's do that. Um, add two toothbrushes. And total price is two dollars. So it'll be pretty much the same as this, but we're going to add two of them. So now, one of the downsides of copying and pasting test code is uh, you may forget to change all the relevant pieces. So if I copied and pasted this, I didn't change this. And so here's where prediction is useful, right? We predict that this is going to fail. 
because well we've we've added two um actually we might and and we may have in our head that we've changed our assertion to two because that's what we want because remember we're trying to write a failing test for if i add multiple items it counts those multiple items so i'm going to predict that this is going to fail because it's going to return one instead of the two that i wanted to return but it passes because i had forgotten to change this number to reflect the change in what this test is doing and so that's where prediction comes in handy um, that oh this should actually be two because that's what i wanted it to be and oftentimes just saying the prediction out loud makes you realize that oh i just said two and it said one that's not right so now we expect it to fail because we actually want it to be two but it is only going to be one because it only holds on to the last product price so it fails as expected and so now <clears throat> i can just do plus equals right that'll get the job done and so it passes now already you know again if i hadn't noticed and thought about why is product name not used um certainly at this point i might be thinking about well hey what if i added two different products does that does that matter so let's come up whoops let's come up with um a different product um well if you're gonna buy toothbrushes you probably want to buy toothpaste as well so let's add that as an item So I'm going to copy and paste this, and we'll say toothpaste is expensive, it's two bucks, and so we expect this to be the sum, which is three. Now, we're just doing plus equals, and so we may think that this is fine, and this will pass. Uh, so one of the things I want to do is I want to say, well, I don't trust this test unless I've seen it fail. So I can change this back to just equals, right? I can sort of mutate and modify my code to see that this fails appropriately. That's one way to do it. And then actually a couple of tests fail. The other way is to sort of force the assertion to be different. So let's say one. And so now I'll, I'll be able to predict how this test fails, right? I've explicitly changed it so that it's wrong. But I should still be able to say, now this is going to say we want one in incorrectly, but we want one and it's going to give us three. So one of the things this does is help us understand what the code is currently doing. And so we see it's returning three as we actually really do want. And so that's fine. So this test didn't really add, add much for us. We've added two different products, but it didn't really really add much because we're not paying attention to the fact that these you know this this test here added to the same product and this test here added two different products there's no difference the cart has we're not able to observe any difference and so we may want to push on that right so if we think about zombies right zero one many we've done zero one many um and so now it seems like we want some features around around the receipt printing. So what would we like? What we'd like is after we add items to the cart, we'd like to get some sort of receipt. Right? What does a receipt look like? It's basically product name, how much it cost, and then total. So who's responsible for that is the question from a tdd standpoint we could put it in cart from a hexagonal architecture standpoint how that works uh is is going to be um depending on what cart actually does right, So remember strings 
sort of these these bare strings are indications that maybe there's there's a missing domain object. But let's let's assume that look, we're just going to try to make it work, and then we'll refactor our way uh, towards hexagonal. So what we want is a test, and again, um, we want to start at at an empty cart. So empty cart receipt So what we're going to say is when we create a cart that when we ask it for its receipt, and so we're going to say this is going to return a string, and we get to say we're going to return null here because it's an object. Um, what do we want it to say is cart is empty, and maybe even um, price is zero. And let's say we want that on multiple lines. Oh, am I using Java 8? Let me upgrade Java. Because uh, I created this with Java 8 um, to support one of my clients who is unfortunately still stuck at Java 8. Uh, we can go to 18. All right. And let me... Yeah. Uh, let me make sure that I am now set at 18. Okay, great. I could do 19, but we'll stick with 18. All right. Oh, did you mess up IntelliJ? You did. You've lost the JDK, haven't you? I hate when IntelliJ does this. Uh... And that's because I've got this thing here. So let's delete that. Okay. Uh, then was, uh, do I prefer testing from the domain instead of the application? So, uh, if I am very clear, um, what the domain needs to do, then I will start with the domain, but, uh, I'm always keeping in mind the, um, basically the application layer, right? So in out, I'm very much thinking outside in, um, here, the application layer, there's not much that it does. And so it sort of is passed through to the domain. Um, and uh, so in general, I, will, I would start fully outside in, but because this is an exercise, we're, we're sort of uh, taking that as a given of, of we're, we're gonna start with cart and see, see where we go. IntelliJ does not like changing things. So let's say this is what we want. We want cart is empty, total price, something like that. So this'll, clearly fail because we're going to just get a null and so fails is expected so now well we could just copy paste this right return that now it passes 
Um, eventually we'll, we'll get to something that might involve spring. Uh, yeah, so that's, so I did not intend to stay at job eight, eight for this demonstration. Um, so that passes, right? And now we can move on to another, uh, failing test. So basically have our toothbrush example. So So now we can say our assertion is that cart receipt is equal to, and so we'll say something like, uh, let's do that. Hex blocks are so annoying though. Uh, in terms of indentation. Um, so what do we want to say? We wanted to say uh, cart has one item. And that item is, what do we say, toothbrush. And we'll put its price next to it. And then we'll have total price is one dollar. So this is a lot, right? Um, this is a lot to implement all at once. Uh, so then says, uh, if I start with, from within the domain, I tend to write more fragile unit tests compared to outside in. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that can definitely happen because you're working almost a too low level without having a clear sense of what is outside. Um, so we're going to, we're sort of doing a little bit of inside out, but then we're going to sort of get our bearings and then do a bit more outside in. Um, in a sense, you could say that the cart right now is the entire application. So it is outside in, uh, other than sort of the actual interactions of like pushing a button or clicking on something. Um, we're starting here is like, this is the boundary of our application. We push it into domain. So that sort of put a boundary around it that now makes us think about certain things like strings. Um, and then we'll use that tension to sort of push things around. So this is a lot. Um, let's, uh, let's split this into sort of multiple stages. Eventually what this, what, this is what we want. Um, except speaking of outside in, this is really a, a very much an outside test and testing against the domain is not where we want it, but we'll see that, that that's going to get, um, uh, clarified. So if we're on it now, we expect it to fail because we're literally comparing strings and they're going to be different. So let's make this larger. So we could make this uh, we could start out with maybe showing the number the the number of items and the item and the total price. Maybe that's too much. So maybe we should take a step back and say, let, what or take take you know, can we take a smaller step? What are we really interested in? So we started with this and maybe this cart was is empty is, was a bit overzealous, right? And oh, 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 uh, too much. Um, and we only realized that though, as, as we, we sort of wrote this test. So let's say, you know what, this is a lot to do. Um, how about, uh, we forget about sort of how big the cart is and just look at sort of items and total price. Eventually we may want this, but right now we don't, we don't, 
uh, we don't absolutely need it to drive our code. So let's let's go back, change this test. Right, so we'll comment this one out and say, you know what? Right now we're just gonna if it, if the card is empty, it just displays total price zero dollars. All right, so it failed because we've changed behavior. Right, changing behavior is the red part, and you're allowed to go back and change tests. Once you write a test, it's not there permanently. We decided, you know what, that's too much to deal with. So let's go ahead and delete that. Now it should pass. And now we can uh, move forward with this. So now this is failing for, for two reasons. We can start with, how about before we get to, to this part, what if we just did this? And then, so we're basically taking a small step within a test. And so some people would say, well, you know, maybe just create a separate test. Um, and that, that, that would be okay. But I think uh, we're talking about the whole receipt. So I, I kind of want that in one assertion, but I can assert part of it and I can get that to work. And then I can uh, expand this test and then see where it goes. So, this will fail because it's going to return zero instead of one, right? The dollar zero instead of dollar one. And that's, that's the difference. Obviously I can't replace this with, um, with one because then the other test would fail. And so we need to think about, okay, where do we have this information from? In fact, we already have this information. And so this is just a matter of, of formatting it. So we can say is we can use the dot format it to fill in that information. And so it uses the formatter for doing that. Um, and that's where we get all the percent S and dollar sign stuff. So we want <clears throat> probably percent S is, is good enough, just general. Um, So what we want is percent %s, and what we want in here is total price. So we predict that this works because the components of this implementation, we know that total price works. Um, and now it's really just a matter of, did we use formatted correctly? So let's see. Yep, got it right. So let's do a commit. Um, we actually did a few things. We moved part to domain package. Uh, and um, and that. So why did we go this way, right? What was our original goal? Our original goal is we wanted to push on this idea of, I want to show the cart contents. So now that we've got this working, right? So this variation of showing the total price work. Now we want to add back that there's a toothbrush in here and that it's a dollar. So now this will fail because there's no toothbrush being displayed. All right, so in fact, if we click to look at the difference, we see that that's the difference. So how do we get that in here? Well, we could, I mean, we could do this, right? Well, it's an option. That gets the test to pass, but then it breaks our old test. So it's clear that we need some kind of variation for, for this. Well, we know where this comes from, except we don't have access to that information, right? We could say, well, that's the, the product price and the product price is the total price, except 
we now have some confusion, right? We have this variable called product price, except we're returning that as part of total price. And didn't really notice that before when I implemented it. But one of one of my heuristics is as soon as you, you have any kind of confusion, you want to clarify it, right? Clarify the, the confusion early rather than let it sit around and people sort of then are afraid to touch it. So let's refactor. Um, but in order to refactor, we need to have uh, all tests passing. So I'll go ahead, comment this out temporarily, run all my tests. And oops, they don't all pass. So let's undo this change. And now all tests are passing. You want to make sure all tests are passing before you do refactoring. Although here, what are we doing? I'm actually just going to do a rename on this variable. We'll just say it's total price. So that was a name change of fairly straightforward refactoring. Everything still passes, so that's fine. And so now we can uncomment this. It'll fail again as, as the same way it did before, but now, at least in terms of the variables I might use here, I'm less confused. All right, so what do we want? We want it to say toothbrush dollar, except we know that that's going to break the other tests. So we know that where does this come from? Well, now we can say, we don't have this anymore. We could put total price there. Because it's like, oh, well, it adds up to one. And maybe that would suffice for this test. But we'd certainly find out soon, uh, sooner rather than later that, that that wouldn't work when we have multiple items. But you know what? Right now, that, that might work. So we'll put in, a, put in that S. And that's just total price again. So let's see if that works. So it works for our current test, but it breaks the other one because we have total toothbrush zero and total price zero. So that's not going to be good enough. So what we can do is, well, we can, if the card is empty, we can return a hard coded string, right? We can basically say, just return this if it's zero. So let's do that. So let's surround this with an if. And uh, what we're saying is if total price is um, only if it's greater than zero, will we show this? Otherwise, we'll return this. Let's try that. All right, remember during the stage of trying to get our test to pass, copying and pasting, writing ugly code, that's totally fine. So now we've captured the, the varying uh, expectations from when the cart is empty to when the cart uh, actually has an item in it. So we want to now refactor. So what we can refactor is, well, let's just pull these out into methods. I don't exactly know what what else is going to happen, but you know, this is uh, format uh, receipt for non-empty cart. And then we can basically refactor this to receipt for empty cart. Run all our tests, they should, they should still pass. Those were just basic e extract methods. It might be tempting to maybe simplify this, um, this if statement and use a ternary operator. To me, that actually doesn't help. The real key is, what the heck does this mean? When I was writing it, I said when the card is not empty, and that's the name of the methods. But total price greater than zero? How do I know that that's whether a card is empty or not? So I can't rename total price because that method name makes sense. 
it's the expression that is a little bit confusing. Well, since I can't rename anything, I can capture it and I can extract it to a method, basically, is... I could say, is card empty, but we're in the context of a cart, so I can just say, is empty. Except now I've reversed it. Right? Because now it reads, if is empty, return it, receive for not empty cart. So that was a naming problem. So this is really is not empty. But I don't like knots. I like garlic knots, but not these knots. Um, I don't like Boolean knots, especially in variable names. Uh, so we want to reverse this. And so we can basically flip the if statement. So we'll invert the if condition. And now we have two knots, right? So we have the, the bang, which inverts it, and then we have the word not. We run our tests to make sure that, because especially when it comes to Boolean, especially it seems like the simpler the Boolean, the, the more confused I get. Um, so we instead want to say is, yeah, is something like non-empty or, 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 or we can say this is now return receipt for empty cart. So now I actually want to flip this. So I can flip this by saying, I want to flip it. So I want to basically say equals zero. Now I know the method name is wrong, but the but and uh, but the test should pass. And now I can adjust the name to make it make sense, which is actually in this case, since I flipped it, now it's is empty, right? Because this is re re return receipt for empty cart. So now this name matches this name, right? If it's empty, return receipt for empty cart. run my test just to make sure I didn't mess anything up, right? And so having these tests, again, gives us the confidence that we haven't broken anything. And we can always, you know, make sure it's like, are we sure that that's capturing that? We can basically change this back to uh, greater than zero and at least one or two tests should fail. And they do. So we know that we've captured this correctly. It does mean that we are defining is empty based on total price. And at some point we'll probably find that's not necessarily going to be correct, but it works for now. So let's commit. And so now what we can do is we can say, great, we've handled a single one. We still have this constant here, right? This basically this literal word toothbrush. Um, so let's write a test that forces us to say, to generalize this. So we could write another test that um, adds a different item like toothpaste uh, but I think we'll capture that without having to take, we could take that step <clears throat> and that would be a tiny step. We could take a larger step. We could say, all right, let's just go to, to multiple items. Um, I don't know that, that, that feels big. So let's, let's do another test that is cart with different item. And so here we're going to say when we add toothpaste, we'll call it two bucks. We expect toothpaste, tooth, toothpaste, two bucks. Um, and the total price should be two bucks. So now we're saying that um, well, the total price should be correct because that's generalized, that's calculated. The $2 here, that should be fine because I got that from the total price, even though technically uh, that will be wrong once we have multiple items. Um, but this, this will be wrong because we have hard-coded toothbrush. 
So we expect that that's going to be the difference. And here's where, you know, using the, the diff in IntelliJ to, to, to show the comparison failure highlights that it's just that one word that is different. So now we have a single thing to change. So let's take this, let's extract it. Can we extract it as a parameter variable? Can we extract this as something? That's too bad. Uh, yeah. It seems to me that it'd be nice if there was a refactor where I could say, can you just extract this to a, a, a formatted thing? That would be nice, but we can't. So we'll do this um, and then we'll need uh, something that's missing. We don't have the product name, right? We could change it to toothpaste, but then we know that would that's not general enough. And so we actually need the product name. That's a refactoring. So let's take a step back, right? So I could, I could go ahead, <clears throat> do what I was going to do, right? Put product name here, create a variable, create a field, store it from the product name that was passed in during add. But that's doing a lot of work while a test is failing. If I can split the work into two pieces, refactor, which is safe, and then using the refactored code, right? I want to make this change really easy. What would make it easy is if I already have product name, right? So as Ken Beck says, um, make the change easy and then make the easy change. So let's make that change easy. Right, so we want to get back to refactoring, so that means this test will comment out. Um, actually, I'm just going to ignore it. It's easier than commenting it out. All right, so all our tests pass. Now let's refactor. Um, let's create a field for product name, and then we'll just hold on to it. So now we have access to it. And in fact, we can actually do more. We can actually replace this because we have a test that's checking it. So we can replace this during this refactoring. And so this should work. And it does. So refactor to uh, introduce field or product name. Now we can turn this test back on. And it will it fail? This may now just work. And it does. So we took a, a small step, except we realized that, that it's just a refactoring, and we refactored it, and now this just works. So do we still need this test? Do we want to see it fail? I'll keep it around. doesn't have a high cost, and does sort of demonstrate that different items will show up differently. Uh, but I would like to see it fail. And so it fails for the right reason. I didn't predict out loud. In my head, I said it was going to fail because I put a, a space in. And so, um, so now that this all passes, now we can look at generalizing this further, right? Now what happens when we have multiple items in the cart? So let's grab this setup. So I'm already a bit frustrated by the fact that I am testing this against the domain, but I'm testing strings. 
So I'm already thinking, first of all, this is really bad. From a hexagonal architecture standpoint, the cart should have no knowledge of what string representation, what presentation representation I want for this. And so now I have to decide, do I want to continue down this road? It's not that much further. Or do I want to say, boy, wouldn't it be easier if I could just check, does the cart have multiple items? Because checking this through strings, you know, and there are tools that can make string checking like this easier, approval tests. But eventually I'm going to want to split this. So maybe maybe now's the time to, to, to make that decision. Because I can already tell, like, what I'm going to be writing as an assertion like this. And this is going to be toothbrush. Uh, whoops. That should be toothbrush. That's toothpaste. And then the total price will be three. And this is going to be annoying. And it really feels like I'm going to be doing a lot of sort of two different things to implement this. There is the thing that I that the code is currently not doing, which is keeping track of the product names. It only keeps track of the last one. So there's the internal structure of cart to store basically the history of ads. But in addition to that, I'm also then going to have to deal with the string formatting, which means there's going to be some kind of loop, which is going to make this thing much more complex. So I have I have two directions to go. One is continue with this and fix both those things at the same time. The other is to re, um, refactor along hexagonal architecture lines. Which way should I go? What would you like to see? Yeah, it's more than a tidy. It's it's a re it's it's almost a re-architecture or an, it's an architectural level refactor. Um let's do this. Um I'm going to uh maybe not maybe not today, but it would be interesting to to go both ways and see where where we end up and see what that looks like. Um I don't know that if we'll have time for that today. Um, let's, let's refactor along architectural, hexagonal architectural lines. Uh, so let's make sure we, we do this. So we now have, um, failing tests. Um, for multiple items. So I'll commit that. And what we can do is, uh, at some other point, um, go back to the previous commit and create a branch from there and see what it would look like, or at least from, from this point, see what it would look like to, to do it not, um, uh, basically not refactoring to hexagonal architecture. So let's drop this test completely, because I'm not even sure I'm going to use it that way. So we should be back at all, all test passing. And we are. Um, so now when we refactor to hexagonal architecture, the thing we want to look at is what in our code is specific to the mode of presentation that we're looking at. In other words, where's the IO? Well, we don't really have an IO, but we have strings, right? We have strings that, that we're kind of making the assumption that it's going to be displayed on a terminal console. Maybe not. Maybe it's being displayed on a little receipt printer. But whatever it is, it's specific for some kind of kind of output. Let's say it's a uh, a display, you know, on these uh, you know self checkout machines, right? Or the the point of sale system. 
So something where it makes sense for it to be displayed in this manner. But that is completely separate from how cart needs to track it, right? So our goal is core domain must have no knowledge of how it's presented in the outside world because it's deep inside here only has to do with calculations and rules and things like that. So let's split that out. This receipt for empty cart, well, that's going to be relatively straightforward, but that's actually a private method. What we're really concerned about is this receipt thing because it returns a string, right? So when we're looking for where's the IO, strings are suspicious, right? Because they're often something that's presentation ready or ready to send out to some somewhere else. We don't want that, at least not in our domain, right? And we said we are now in our domain. So what we want to do is who's responsible for creating this receipt? Well, that would be the receipt printer. That is something that is hardware. It's in the outside world. And so immediately that means it is pushed into some kind of adapter. What's interesting is, is this an outbound adapter or an inbound adapter? Like, does it just push changes out? And this is where not starting outside in, like what triggered this whole thing? Where did this add method get triggered from the outside world? So we're kind of missing that. And so without knowing about that, right, does somebody push a button? Is there a scanner that scans on a, the barcode on an item? And then that's how the ad comes in. And so to figure that out, we'd have to say, okay, what, what's the goal here? So let's define that. So let's say, and here we're sort of, you know, we talk to our subject matter experts and said, hey, we, we think we have, you know, some sense of how this pricer part's going to go, but we're trying to build the whole system and like, right, just building the pricing portion doesn't have, doesn't actually give us enough information. It does say the self-service, right? So if we're integrate, right, you know, we're the pricer team and we're going to have to integrate with other things. It's, it's, then, so we're going to ask the question of how did those hey, somebody added this product, how does that come in to our system? All right? what is the API we expose from our service to the other parts of the machine? And so, you know, I'll make something up, but this is where we'd be talking about what is the contract between the scanner, right? So we said self-service, so it's gonna have a scanner between that and the pricer really the cart. It's not just the pricer, because actually we are keeping track of that because we are required to present the, the receipt. So let's put um, a scenario here. So um, product information comes in as Right? Let's say that we're actually not responsible for looking up the product in some external service. We're given, hey, here's the name of the product and here is its price. Because receipt, all you care about is those two pieces of information. At least that's all we think we need right now. So that means that 
Um, we still have the question though, right? We're saying that receipt doesn't belong in here. Basically everything around receipt doesn't belong in here. Right? Basically all this code does not belong in here. We're saying it belongs in some kind of adapter, except have we fully answered the question, where does it go? Well, we know the add, the thing that triggered this, right, was some inbound event, an inbound message saying, add this item to the cart, here's the name and here's its price. Do we send that to some other system, like the displace part of the system? Or is that a response back to the caller? Well, if it's coming in from a scanner, we're not going to send it back to the scanner. Right? Or the, you know, maybe, you know, some controller in, in the system. We're not going to send it back there. We're just going to maybe send it directly out to the display. That may not be the right architecture eventually but for now that's that's what we we think we know right so the incoming request so product or product um Right, so we're gonna, you know, the display says, yeah, just send us that stuff. We'll we'll just display it on the screen. We're not gonna worry about scrolling and, and things like that. Um, so we will display the full receipt every time, right? Because we're not gonna print it, we're just put, putting it on a display. So anytime an ad comes in, we wanna keep track of it, and then we wanna send it out to, to a system. So even though all this software might actually be, you know, in a little application that's deployed, right, one off for this this thing, um, the 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 different parts of the system can still still be treat they're external to our our cart module, right? So we if we have a modular system that's still the read dis receipt display system is still external. So that means um, what we want to do is sort of push these tests out. We want to test against something else, right? So what we're saying is that in fact, let's do this. Let's say we've got something like this, All right? So this is our system. We've got a receipt display here, and we've got our product scanner. And so what we're testing, the boundary that we're going to be writing the next test against is not here. It's actually here. So we're going to write a test against the application layer that when an item is added, it's going to display something on our display. Now, what's interesting about doing this, starting out with this, is um, it's actually the, the the opposite direction that I usually start with. Usually I start testing this and then seeing how it responds to this and then pushing it out to here. Um, but I think it'd be really interesting to start here, right? We know that you know we don't want to write the product scanner but we know how the product scanner is going to interact with our application it's going to call add and give us the product name and the price and what we want is something sent out to receipt display well this thing is hardware so we can't have direct access to it 
And so we're going to need to replace this um, with something that uh, we can verify in a test. What you might know is mocking, but we're going to have to have some test double here. Uh, let's change it to that. So somewhere we're going to need to have some test double, right? Because what we're checking is this boundary here. So I haven't I haven't done this this kind of thing. So this is this is an interesting place we've ended up. So let's 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 keep pushing on this. Um, so let's now take a step back and say, okay, we now have this receipt printer, um, and but it's an outbound adapter, which means we don't directly have a reference to it. So what's the next step to take? Um, Cause so one of the things I'm thinking of is, yeah, we could, we could have a test double, but that feels like a, a lot of work just to get to sort of where we are. And we haven't really done, it's like what we really want is we just wanted to remember multiple products. So how can we get sort of all that, that extraneous stuff out of the way? And so what I want to do is I want to say, well, what if we forget about the existence of the receipt display at all? Right, let's, let's refocus on just the, the application layer. So to get our to get that way to to a refactor, we could say, you know what, right now I'm not going to worry about it being an outbound adapter. How about we just um, still have a way to to ask for a receipt, but we ask the application for that receipt. All right, so we actually have to trigger that. So that makes it simpler. And then we can say, okay, then we want the receipt to be automatically pushed out, right? So now we have to do a manual query against our application. Hey, can you give me the receipt? So let's do that. So let's write a test. This will be um, our... We'll call it our tech checkout test. And so what we want is a test that's pretty much what we had before. So we kind of want to move the test that deal with strings. We want to move those because they're not domain specific. We want to move those into an adapter. So let's change this We're going to move it to adapter. Um, do you want to move this to adapter? I'm actually not sure where, where it's going to go yet. Uh, certainly not domain, though. So I think it'll be adapter because it's not going to be application because we want string stuff. We know that's not uh, that's not the job of the application. So yeah, so let, let's move this to adapter. Um, and this is coming in from the scanner, so we'll do that. And so the test that we want is um, the sort of the first one that had strings in it, which is this one. 
So we want to say that how this receipt is displayed, that's a uh, an adapter concern. I'm going to grab this, put this here. Um, And let's actually call this scanner test. We might change that again. So what we want is we want some kind of scanner object, right? And this is going to be an adapter. And what we, in a sense, we, we want to do is um, wrap the cart with almost a decorator. And so sort of from this point of view, the, the um, this conversion to strings is really like, like a decorator, uh, in a way, All right? We're taking, we want to take some cart contents and, and wrap it. All right. Thanks for stopping by RV, right? RV, right? So this test, obviously, so we'll, now that we move, let's actually move this test. We'll delete it from here. Um, and we want to now make sure we're running all of our tests. So I'm going to run, uh, create a run configuration for all tests. And um, that all passes. And so what should a scanner have? Well, let's create one. Um, I, I sort of want to avoid calling this a scanner because that's something that's built into to the Java, um, the SDK, but that's, we'll, we'll leave it. So scanner, uh, this is the downside of auto imports. No, don't import that. Yeah, stop importing that. Well, we'll do this for now and it's going to, it'll, it'll cause us problems. Um, so we want this to compile, but we want it to use our own scanner. Uh, so let's go and create one. And this is not in our domain, but it is in our adapter. And now, um, We'll disambiguate which one we want. Um, oh, we don't need to because it's in the same package. So great. All right. So we can actually close that for now. So what we want is we want to basically move this receipt behavior to scanner because it's really scanner's job to do that. Um, what we want, though, is we want scanner to have a cart. So let's pass that in and let's go ahead and create a constructor. And the reason why is this is the dependency direction between adapters and domain, All right? So adapters have reference into our domain, All right? They can have a dependency, right? That's basically this dependencies point inwards. So our adapter can ever reference the application. We don't have an application layer yet, so we can use our core domain uh, as a stand-in for that. So our application layer doesn't yet exist. It will at some point. And what we want is we want the method to be called against scanner, because that's the one that should return strings. And then cart receipt should go away. So we'd like then there to be a method on scanner, which is receipt. Now, again, already is like, well, we said scanner receipt. We're trying to take a small step. We're going to then move this behavior elsewhere. But right now we want an easy way um, to, uh, to get that information. So we'll create the method, we're going to return a string and return null. So this absolutely doesn't work. 
But what we want now want to do is we want to say, I'd like to move that code from cart to here. But let's just treat this as, as sort of pure delegation. So let's go ahead and create a field for cart. And let's call cart.receipt. Now the test should pass. And does. Now, what we'd like to do is we'd like to inline this. I don't know if it'll let us do that, right? Because we want the code that does the receipt printing. We want it here. Um, let's see what happens if we try to inline it. So what it says is, well, uh, you can't because um, this is empty method. The receipt and the receipt, right, for empty cart, not empty cart is not accessible. All right, so then let's go to, to that. And what we can do is we can sort of do the same thing we were doing before in terms of taking small steps, right? We can basically take the tests that were in cart test and move them to scanner test and then make them only work at that level. So for the empty cart, that's gonna be straightforward. We can basically just take this case, which is receipt for empty cart, we can just grab this code. In fact, we can just take this entire method and move it to here and then just call receipt for empty cart here. Now, by moving it out of here, we're basically breaking this code, but actually we're saying we don't want that. We don't care about that. All our tests should still pass because we what we did was we moved a test that was basically against this boundary. And we basically said we don't want that code in there anyway. And so we moved a test to this boundary. And so the code that handled that test moved out. Right, so we basically want to add more tests to, to force us to move more code out. Well, is empty is no longer used here, so we can delete this, which is actually good because is empty was kind of bugging me that it was checking the price, and that seems inappropriate. Um, now it's just not used at all. So that was a refactoring, our test still pass. So, um, moved uh, rendering moved code that was the art from main to adapter. And so um, now we can do, so let me just fix something. Okay. Yep. So I meant to release the course in, in June. That's not going to happen. Uh, because today's June. <laughs> today's the last day of June, so it's not happening today. Um, but it will will be happening in July. Um, so what we want to do is continue moving out the tests from uh, the, the cart test to move them against the scanner into scanner test. So let's go to cart test. Where did that go? Cart test.
And so we want to basically continue taking the code that's that's checking the rendering of the cart and moving it to an outer level. So we'll take that, put that here. We want to test against scanner. So the setup is basically the same here. And so if we run our test, this should pass because this test that we just moved is not yet testing at the correct boundary, right? It's still testing against cart. What we want it to do is test against scanner. But let's make sure our tests pass, and then we'll change it, and we'll be in sort of TDD mode. Okay, so now we want this to be against scanner. All right, so now it's it, this test is testing at this level. So now we expect it to fail because it's only returning receipts for empty carts. And so it fails as we expected it to. So now what we want to do is we want to take the receipt for a non-empty cart and basically just grab it um, and put it here. And now we see the crux of our problem. The information we need from the cart is unavailable to scanner. Right? Scanner needs to be able to ask the cart, hey, what's the product names and the prices and the, the total price? So we can't just move this yet. And so what we can do is we can actually refactor our way there. So what we want to do is we want to isolate this, this method. And this is a technique I, I also show in, in my course, which is um, we need to isolate this so that this method can be moved. Well, what is keeping us from moving it is a reference to these, uh, at least this piece of information. Total price is, accept is accessible, but it's product name that's not. Well, that's fine. So let's create a method that says product name. That feels weird. But our goal is to move and split the representation rendering part from the storage part. And we may go through some steps that are ugly, but this this we're trying to sort of retain um, basically all of our tests that, that currently pass. So we may find that, that that's not the API we're going to want from our cart. Um, but it'll get us get us there. So what we want to do is we want to extract product name into a query method. Query method, not a getter. Now, whenever we extract a method, we always want to ask the question, is this okay? Are we revealing information that's directly accessible that somebody could modify? Well, no, we're returning a string. A string is immutable, right? So no caller could change it. Does it make sense to have product name on, on a cart? Well, if it's a cart can only hold one item, sure, why not? Which is really the state we're in. It really only kind of holds one item in terms of the product names that it remembers. So now that we've done that, now we can take this receipt for, for non empty cart. Um, we could make it static and then move it over, but I'm just going to actually cut it. Um, sorry, I'm going to make it static because because one of the next things we need to do is we need to fix up this code and making this method static will fix up this code because it will force us to pass in a cart here. So let's do that. Let's make it static. And so now this code was transformed for us. Now we can take it, we can move it over to scanner. I don't know why it wanted me to move it the other place. Uh, oh, product name is private. Let's make that public, All right? So we evaluated that this was okay to make public. So now we can move this. To scanner.
Not sure why it's not letting me auto-complete that. So we'll just do that. I think that's a bug. So now that we've done that, this method... is now in the right place. Um, but we haven't yet made our, our test pass. Right, so remember, we're, we're trying to make this one where it shows a single item. So we've got the right uh, code for that. And now we need to decide whether a cart is empty or not. So we could again ask uh, evaluate based on whether the, to the total price is zero, because we have access to that. And that should suffice for now. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. Let's first make this non-static. So the way we make it non-static is um, there's no automated way to do it for what we want. So we'll delete this. And then we delete the parameter because we know that we can access the cart that is a field. And yes, we know that. But by doing that, by changing to not static, we actually broke receipt. Um, so that tells us actually that there's one more test that we need to move over. So we kind of could say, well, could keep it static until we move everything over. Or I could just say, you know what, let me just move this test over. And this will eventually be against scanner, but we can comment this out. And that this is going to be against scanner. So what we've done is we've purified our cart test. Cart test now no longer references anything having to do with how the receipt is printed. So we can close this now. We basically pulled everything out of there. Cart no longer has, it has receipt, but no, no, nobody's using it anymore. So we can delete that. And now our cart is domain pure. Well, other than this product name, but we'll come back to that. So we can close cart for now and focus now on getting scanner to, to work properly. So we've got tests against this that are that are basically failing and we want to get them to work. So the way we do that is we basically say the receipt has to decide whether the cart is empty. So again, we can wrap this with an if statement. If cart total price equals zero, then we consider it empty. Otherwise, we return receipt for non-empty cart. So this should restore us to back where we were. This this if statement look should look familiar. But now we're back at passing tests. So we've moved the behavior of rendering the contents of the cart as a receipt into this scanner class. Now, I originally moved this into the scanner class because it's going to be the one that handles the input. Um, but I realized where, where we ended up is this is just uh, the display portion. But, you know, maybe the name isn't, isn't great, but we'll, we'll keep pushing on this. We now have at least passing tests. And we now have that scanner is doing the work of formatting and cart is only concerned with domain knowledge. So why did we do this again? What was our, what was our point? Our point was to separate the rendering from the tracking of multiple products in the cart. So now we can focus on that. 
Now we can put the scanner stuff to, to the side and we can say, okay, there's some stuff we need to deal with there. But we wanted to focus on how can we test that the cart handles multiple products to be used for, for display. And so now we have a better sense of what we might need from cart in terms of its API. We have to have some way of finding out, hey, cart, what do you have in there? And if we weren't sure, we could go back to scanner and say, hey, what did you need again? I don't know why. That's so weird that IntelliJ is not doing a find for scanner. Uh, let me try something. I think there's a, I think there's a bug in IntelliJ. Because when it was just called Scanner, which is the same name as in the Java Util Scanner, uh, it wasn't able to find it because it tends to look inside the project, and I think it's confused. Um, so we're going to call it Scanner Printer because actually that's kind of its job now, and we'll see that we want to split that later. Um, so let's actually rename the test as well. And we'll rename these variables. Actually, let's rename this back to scanner. And then we will rename it back to scanner printer. So we can let it rename all the variables. There we go. Run all our tests. And everything should pass. Um, one thing we'd want to do is our scanner printer test. Uh, we want to, so receipt shows zero price and no item scanned. Um, let's rename this method. Receipt shows item and price for one item scanned. And receipt shows multiple item names and prices in total. And let's run all our tests, make sure we didn't break anything. And there we go. Uh, so I renamed scanner to scanner printer as it's doing both jobs right now. So at this point, uh, we could take on the scanner role of the scanner printer and have it call the add method on cart. Um, but what I want to focus on is, is the cart itself in terms of being able to support uh, multiple products. So now that we have a better idea of what the scanner printer wants, right? when we want to display its receipt for a non-empty cart, what we're going to want to do is for each row here, right? Which we've been sort of cheating with this cart product name, cart total price, but that doesn't work when we have multiple items, right? So for this test uh, that we're going to want to write, that's not going to work. But the reason why we want to move to cart is we don't want to write another test at this level. This is too much work. So we need to go back here and say, in addition to having supporting multiple ads and keeping track of the price, we'd like to keep track of the products as well. But again, we can't just decide at this level, what is the method we want to call, right? So what we want is add multiple items, then part then uh, 
right? So we want something about the contents of the cart. So we'll create a cart. And we'll add a couple items. But that's really the, the given part, right? Given a cart with multiple items, when we ask the cart for its contents, and so maybe we just call it contents, but what does it return? Clearly we don't want strings. And so what do we return? Well, what does our adapter need? Right? What does the outside world need from our cart? It needs, for all items, it needs its product name and price. Because right, we want to display that once per product. We already have the total price. That's already taken care of. But we need a way to access product name and price. Well, where did it get that information from? Well, that was in the ad. And so now what we need, because we can't return two, two objects, right? You can only return a single, there's only a single object to return. Now we're really kind of forced to create a new type. Because what we'd like is we'd like contents to return a list of something or a stream of something. And what is that something? Well, it can't be string because that would just be the product name. It can't be the formatted string because that's not the job of the cart. So it needs to be a new type, probably a value object called product. So let's do that. We'll create a method. And we're going to want to return product. Because um, right now, we'd like to be backwards compatible. So actually, once we have a sense of what this is going to be, we're like, wait, we're not ready for this yet. Let's refactor the current code to support product before we deal with multiple products. All right. So again, we, how do we make this method easy? It'd be great if product already existed. It would be so much easier to write this code if product already existed and there was a list of product already in cart. So then let's not write this yet and let's not write this test yet. Let's refactor to product. Let's introduce a parameter object. So we'll create a new class. We're going to call it product. It's going to be in our domain. And it's going to have these two parameters, string and it. Boom. This was a pure refactoring, totally IntelliJ driven. It replaced note in our test, it replaced handing in just a string and, and the int with new product. So our test should all pass, assuming IntelliJ did its job correctly, which, you know, it doesn't always do. Sometimes it makes mistakes, um, but that all worked. So let's go ahead and, and commit that. So now we have product, at least as a parameter. We kind of want to store that too. So instead of storing product name, how about we just store product? Because product has product name. So create a field for the product. So again, we're still refactor mode. We're still in refactor mode. And that just introduced a new field that's not, not really used. Let's now change product name to return product, product name. Because right, our goal is to actually get rid of this string. So now it's unused, but our tests still pass. And now we can get rid of product name. 
Um, so we can convert it to a local variable, and then basically this local variable is no longer needed, so we can remove it. Test should still pass. And they do. So now we have something that step by step, little step by little step, looks like what you might have originally jumped to. But every step was driven by an actual need from a test. We know we needed that thing because our test said so. Or indirectly said so. So we now refactored, right? We now have cleaned up and tidied up card. Um, and so now let's look at where product name is used. It's used here. Turns out that this is technically wrong. But we don't actually have a test to, to tell us that it's wrong. And that's actually the next test we're going to write. Right, that's this test. When we have multiple items, we'll be forced to abandon total price, um, but we'll be getting products, and so that will actually be fine. So since we we could treat this as a refactor and say, boy, wouldn't it be great if, in addition to product name, it returned product price? And so we can treat that as a refactoring, say, that should be a no-op. No, no behavior change. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's drive that um, sort of indirectly through a test. All right, so our indirect test is basically this, this kind of test, testing against scanner. And we could write a test directly against this that we return a product. Um, but you don't always have it Refactors don't always need to be driven by, uh, like refactors are, are often not driven by tests. This is a refactor. The behavior isn't changing. So we can say what we'd like, right? So we can introduce new methods. This is my point. We can introduce new methods without having a, a test. We can say what we want is we want a method called product. that returns the product name. So this is a manual refactoring. But this is basically equivalent. The other way we could have done this, instead of manually, is we can inline it. Uh. Ah. So we can't inline it. Hey, Guy Royce, welcome, folks. Bringing your party over here. So uh, currently I'm doing the checkout pricer exercise. Hey, Wheatlow. Um, and so basically doing TDD and hexagonal architecture for it. So the reason why I can't inline this is because this method uses product. And so we can, again, refactor our way here. We can say, well, let's just introduce a query called product. Now we can inline this. Did I make it not public? I did not make it public. Now we can inline it. And all our tests should pass. <laughs> and for this 
this is not really the total price. We want this to be product uh, product price. So do we have that? Does product have that? Well, interestingly enough, it does because when IntelliJ refactored and extracted that delegate, it actually created a record, which by default has product name and product price as method names. So we should be able to replace this with product, oops, product price. That should be equivalent. How do we know? We run a test and they all pass. So we have pulled out product into its own thing. We've exposed it here. And that means this method, this product name is no longer needed. So we can go ahead and delete it. So now cart has ability to add products, but we can only retrieve the last one. It looks like, which is fine because then we can, uh, drive that implementation through this. And then we'll get rid of, so we're going to generalize product, but let's do a commit since we've got, since we did some changes, um, completed extraction of product, uh, part now, product. and it looks like we got a redemption for, for dark mode. So let's go ahead and do that. Oops. I installed a different uh, dark mode, except, oh, did it also change the font size? You're not supposed to touch the font size. Did you change the, f what? No, 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 you don't do that. You don't change fonts. That's, that's evil. Uh... Yeah, that looks good. That's a no-no. If you're going to write a plug-in theme and you're going to change my font, you're out of here. Hey, Fat Dog. Uh, the repo um, that I'm working on, uh, I have not pushed anything there. It is Supermarket Checkout Pricer. Um, I guess I should expose that. Uh, it's not this one. Actually, what is it? Oh, it is. So. So this is uh my current repo. I'll actually do. I'll actually do a push. I'm I'm working on a branch. Um because uh, the idea is for the exercise for you to do this yourself. All right. Um, whenever I switched to dark mode, I was like, what the heck was I doing? So all our tests pass, we move product. Right, so um, our eventual goal is we want multiple items and now we can actually um do this uh let's grab this and so now contents should report uh all the products so do we want to call it contents or products
Let's call it products. Actually, let's call it product, right? So what we want to do is, is assert that um, the cart products uh, contains exactly. Come on. Oh, you're not going to be able to do that. So. Uh, ah, OK. So there's another intermediate step. So before we can get to this, we want to. And this is actually um, a common sequence of refactorings, right? We started out with a single thing that it was returning, uh, or a single piece of information, which was the product name. Now we have cart returning a single thing, product. Except we don't want product. We want products. So that means we want to do a refactoring so that all the code that's currently adding multiple products, um, they should still pass... In fact, what is checking this is really just the scanner printer. So the fact that it's gonna, we're going to return a list, we're going to have to do that as a refactoring. So uh, that's why I got my refactor hat on. Uh, so let's do that. Let's change this. Instead of returning a single product, let's make it return stream of product or list of product. So list of product would imply that it's something that you could manipulate. But we want to sort of limit what somebody can do when they're getting this information. So I think stream of product would be better. And so now we've got to fix up the usages of it. Should I do this the refactoring way? There's a way to do this with several, uh, uh, with, with basically a composite refactoring. Um, but I feel like that that's overkill for this case. So we're just going to say dot um, find first get actually before we do that let's see this let's pull this out into a local variable and that'll be a little bit easier Because then we can say um, dot find first get, and then this is just product. There we go. So we could have gotten gotten there through a, a few uh, interesting refactors, but I'll leave that for another time. Remind me, I'll sh I'll show that. All right. So let's. This was a refactoring, right? So our test should still be passing. And no, my hat's not green, because if it were green, it would be disappear, because I have a green screen. Just like this, this is invisible. Invisible bag. Um, so our tests still passed. That means our refactoring worked. And now that uh, what we've done is now cart is able to return multiple products. So let's rename the method to really be products. I really do like contents better. Because product is like cart.products. Cart.contents feels nicer. Let's do that. The contents are a stream of products. That's fine. It doesn't The name doesn't have to exactly match. So let's do a commit. Um, I shall go ahead and push that. Why not? What branch are we on? We're on stream. Okay. 
So you'll find this on the um, stream branch. And no, I don't want to pull requests. All right. Um, so now that we've made uh, all these changes we've done, we're refactoring. So we know everything is still working. Now what we can do is we can finally, finally turn this test on. And we can say this contains exactly these products. Oops. There we go. So let's see. This should work. Um, couldn't find the toothbrush. Ah, great. I forgot. We're not in refactor mode anymore. <laughs> we are in change behavior mode. The whole point was to get to the point where we would store multiple products. We are not storing multiple products. But now we have the structure for it, right? In terms of the API returning all products. Um, we're only storing a single product. So maybe we could even change this with a refactoring. I think we can. Let's do that. Let's go. Let's go all the way. So we're back in refactor mode, put my refactor hat on. And uh, I'll get to your question next proof in a, in a, in a bit. Um, so what we want to do is internally we want to uh, store this probably internally as a, as a list because storing you can, internally as a stream makes no sense. So we want this to be a list. Um, we could encapsulate the field, but that's a that's a bit too far. So let's just change it. I'm a bit obsessed about um, trying to use automated refactorings, and sometimes it's just like, that's just not worth it. Let's just make the, the change. We've got good task coverage. Uh, so here, remember, we are not changing behavior. So we want to emulate the behavior that we've got. Um, so that means product, the equivalent of product is product get zero. Products. And this we're basically treating the list as like a one dimensional array. Now, I don't think this will work because it hasn't been, I, I don't think you can set zero if nothing has been added to it. So let's find out, I don't know. I think that'll fail. Yeah, because it's null, right, of course. So let's make it not null. Let's create a new array list. I think that'll still fail. Yeah, because it's out of bounds. So what we can do is we can um, new array list. Um, I don't know. Is it, how much worth it is? Is it to keep backwards compatibility? Let's see. Instead of set, what if we just did add? So everything still works. So we haven't broken any existing behavior, which is what we want, right? We want to make sure we're not breaking existing behavior. Uh, let's also fix this. And yes, I know dark mode is over, but my stream is almost over anyway. So we'll just leave it dark. So make that final. Um, let's do a commit. Okay, so now, now 
we've refactored our code where we're storing it in products where we could wonder, could we return this just as products? Will that pass our current tests? Oops. Uh, not stream of products, but now product stream. Is that the same or is that change in behavior? Well, it's the same. So let's go ahead and commit. Actually, I'm going to amend that commit. Now I think we can finally make the change. Uh, that's true. I could do a new array list instead of add. Um, but this is sort of closer to what I eventually want uh, and doesn't break existing behavior. So I think it's I, I think it's fair. Um, so X proof in terms of how do you test multi-threaded code, uh, basically minimize the code that's actually doing the multi-threading and make everything else work and do lots of immutable objects. And so multi-threaded depends if it's doing things in uh, sort of parallel and I always forget parallel versus versus concurrent, but basically if it's doing things where it's not modifying shared data, so basically try to make sure your code isn't modifying shared data, shared mutable state, not shared data, shared mutable state. Um, and then when you actually need to do that, really think about, do you need to do that? And then tend towards make, making it immutable. So my goal, um, so somewhat similar, maybe somewhat like what Wheatlaw said is my goal is, is to turn concurrent, multi-threaded, shared mutable state code to just not do that. And then it's easier to test. Um, beyond that, I'm not good at that. I'm not the right person to ask. Uh, right, Suiji. Yeah, could have, could have, could have done that. But also, my goal is like I want to make the the. I don't want to just make purely the equivalent. I do want to make the change easy. So I want to get as close, sort of as close as possible to the code I need, um, without changing the existing behavior. So this is pretty much the code I need, at least that the test is asking for. Um, and it's not breaking any tests, so yeah. All right. So now does this work? Can we make this work? So here's where maybe um, the change I did was too much, right? I think this will pass and it does, right? So maybe I went too far. So to Suiji's point, let's, we can sort of take a step back and we can say, Look, we want to be precise. We don't want to accidentally add new behavior. And it's a, it's a fine line. And I don't always, I don't usually think about it too much. Um, but let's, let's be like really, um, we can get rid of this products dot equals new. We can treat it as an immutable thing, right? Could say actually list of product um, and take off the final here. So this should work. And then if we turn this test on, this should fail because it's only storing the last product. All right. So the last product was toothpaste and uh, this is what we got. It stored only the last one. Still had the correct pricing total, but it only stored the, the, the the last, the last one. Um, so we have made it, um, we've made the change easy, but we've also been careful to not change existing behavior, All right? We're basically treating this as, as a singleton list that only holds one item. I guess technically we didn't need to assign it this. Now we can make the change that actually changes the behavior. Right now we're in red mode, so we expect this test to fail. We saw it fail. So now we can change it so that this is what it was before.
And that should now pass. And it does. And now we can make this final. And it still passes. So how did this help us? Well, now we know how we want to store multiple items in the cart. And we can store multiple items in the cart. And we can assert that those items were in the cart. Right? This test is a lot easier to write and assert than what we'd ended up ending up than what we would have ended up writing at the scanner level, which is adding the items and then asserting some some string stuff. Because this test here and this test here, and in fact, this test here, right? All these strings, if I want to say, hey, you know what? We want uh, some different spacing. We want the dollar signs to line up. Well, now I'd have to change this test and this test and every single test that is testing that, right? So testing at a difference, at a distance, right? The further you away, are away from the code, right? So I'm not, scanner printer is testing code that's really in, in scanner printer. If it were all in cart, that would be really difficult to test. And these kinds of changes would blow up and break a bunch of tests. These kinds of tests tend to be brittle, but you do need some of them. So we now have um, a cart that is knows how to handle multiple products. Uh, we can add them. We extracted product as uh, turns out as a record. Um, I'm not crazy about the names now that these are in something. We can actually drop the prefix. So something that, that Suiji pointed out before is they both have the same prefix, the word product, but we don't need that anymore. So let's change this to name. And then we can change this to price. And that should change everything else. Run our tests. So we've, um, the cart now supports moving all of its contents. and uh, products, properties, no longer have redundant. Why are these highlighted? I don't understand that. That's just weird looking. So let's take a look at this. Um, let's, yeah, dark mode is definitely over. We're now in the conclusion phase of today's stream. Um, so let's go back to something I can read. Sorry, I should have warned you. Put your sunglasses on. Ah, uh, there we go. Uh, bug me later, please. Uh, where was I going? I was going here. And... Um, I'll go for a little bit more. So we started out by just testing against cart. We found that when we got to the receipt part where we started dealing with strings, um, that started uh, making the test a bit harder to deal with. And um, 
we still don't have the scanner supporting multiple products, right? We don't have a test for that. Um, so maybe we'll write one more one more test to, to get that. That will fully then generalize this method, and then we can basically be done with with the receipt portion. Uh, so let's do that. Let's go add that last test. Oh yeah, I guess IntelliJ highlights it in light mode too. It's just I guess maybe less obvious to me. Um, So what we want is so there's this two things. So one, we could write another test, and we'll go ahead and do that. Um, but this is starting to get annoying, right? And it's actually not necessary. Um, so I'll talk about that in, in a second. So uh, actually, this test was just supposed to show multiple item names and prices in total. So let's do that. So let's add this and what we expect is uh we brush one dollar and this to be three um we expect this to fail because it's only retrieving the first product so it's not gonna have toothbrush in it the price will be right though yeah so the price is right um but it doesn't ha didn't have a uh, toothbrush in it. And to more clearly see this, we can view this. We can see that toothbrush is missing. And we should IntelliJ formatted this as a multi-line string. Maybe I should file an issue for that. Cause like this quote is really weird. And then this quote down, yeah. So I've been filing lots of issues with IntelliJ lately uh, with JetBrains. Okay, so how do we fix this? Well, um, we do the same thing as we did before. We treat this as, how can I make this next change easy? So what would the change have to be is I need to repeat just this line of text for every product. But that's a huge jump from where we are now. Uh, I can't do that with just a multi-line string, right? We have to have some kind of loop. So instead, what we can do is a refactoring and refactor out the portion that we think is, is going to then be generalized. So let's turn off this test, get back into refactor mode, and I'm not going to switch the hats back again. Um, and so what we want to do is we, in a sense, want to... I'd love to be able to extract this. This is another feature maybe I should file an issue for. It would be great to extract this into a placeholder that then had some representation here. Oh, Costa Daniel C, thank you so much for your Prime Gaming subscription. I appreciate it. I know you only get one of those a month, so thank you for spending it here. Thank you. Um, by the way, uh, Discord, if you want to ch chat about this stuff that I'm doing, um, Discord's the place to do it. Uh, also, this is uh, this content is also going to be um, and content like it and explaining some of the larger issues is in my refactoring tax algorithm architecture course that's coming out next month. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, so unfortunately there's no way to do that. So I think what I can do is grab this. Let's see. Uh, I'll basically grab this, replace it with this. Um, then grab this, um, yeah, boy, I'm really wishing for like a refactor here. Uh, so we're going to do string, um, product row equals that dot formatted. And then it's this. And then that's this. I think that should be the same. Let's see. There might be some extra line feeds in it. Let's see what happens. Yeah, so I think I've got an extra line feed. Right. 
because that should be <clears throat> that. And I do not like the way IntelliJ is formatting this. See, I think IntelliJ should line up the, the triple quotes, even though the boundary is here because of the way that works. It's very confusing to me. Okay, so we've now done a manual refactoring of splitting up the string. Um, so now what we can do is we, we, that we've got that because this is what we want to iterate over. So let's extract this to a method, which is um, product to row. Uh, row display, row seat row. Product to receipt entry. I don't know if I like entry or row. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Suiji suggests, is there a factoring? No, there's nothing to turn that into string concatenation. Um, mainly because this is not string concat. I mean, this S is string concatenation, but it's a little bit more complex than that. So it would not be a straightforward refactoring. Uh, so let's inline this. So that returns that. This should be the same thing. So we've now made, uh, once again, we have made the change to multiple product rows in receipt. Easy. Next we'll make the easy change. Same definition of easy. Yeah, I wonder if this is actually easier to read as um, string concatenation. But I'll leave it that way. Uh, so I'm not quite done because if I want multiple ones of these, do I iterate through multiple ones first and create a create products rows or should I just convert this to string concatenation uh, I could do a mapping and then a join on that method let's do that um, so what we're going to say is uh, let's take our contents, change the variable, and now what we want is um, product row equals so the product map uh, we want to map each one to product seat entry ah. and then we want to join uh, somewhere there's new line stuff so I'm not sure where that joining is going to happen um, This should also work, or there might be some new line stuff that, that I'm not sure about. So let's see. So that all worked. Um, and so now we can turn this test on. Will this pass? I think it'll either pass or be close enough in terms of new line stuff. So again, let's see. Uh, yep, so it was off by the, the new line here. The word is correct. Um, but this, 
the line break should be there. So let's, um, we could say joining with a line break, or we could change this to a line break. I think if I do this, uh, it will break some other things, but I think I can then remove the space here to take up that difference. So if I do this, there we go. And let's rename this to product rows. Um, and we can just inline this. And there we go. So that gets us to um, our cart. Uh, we can make that file. That's fine. And so we split along the parts that we're applying to multiple. Right, but we did that as part of a refactor as opposed to part of behavior change. And then our behavior change was was basically this, was then iterating through all the rows and converting them. We could have even done that. Um, again, it's like once we left the world of getting the first item and, and went and entered the world, where we we're just streaming across all of them. That's that's a bigger behavior change. So we took that that step as part of the behavior change as opposed to refactoring. And now we have a cart that we add items to it. Um, this is still a bit annoying, but but I'll talk about uh, at some future point about what um, what's an, what's really going on here, because I am testing the scanner printer through the cart. Um, and it's not a lot of work to do it through the cart. What are we really doing is basically testing did we format stuff and did we format stuff and did we print sort of the correct card or not um and this can actually be private right and so let's clean this up let's move the public stuff up and let's do a commit So this isn't necessarily a problem that we're using cart um, because that's what uh, this code is, is doing. Where it can get a little bit more complicated is around the rules of, well, what happens when we actually change our domain so that uh, when we add, you know, a toothbrush and a toothpaste we say hey you got a bit of a discount for multiple items uh then we're gonna have to change this except that no code here changed so what i want for my tests is to test that something changed in the code that i'm testing if because uh, the cart changed that i need to change my scanner printer tests that's not great it's sometimes you can't avoid it, uh, but in this case, we would be able to avoid it. Um, or at least sidestep it a bit, uh, but I'll, I'll leave that for, for another stream. So we've gotten, we sort of didn't focus too much on the, on the cards behavior, right? We didn't, we didn't even get to, to any of the special deals because we wanted to focus on refactoring uh, towards hexagonal architecture. And so our um, project structure is now basically this, right? We've got our adapter, an inbound scanner. It basically, we're sort of treating it as an in and out, right? It adds stuff to the cart. We haven't actually explored that aspect of the adapter yet. Um, and then what it gets when it queries uh, the receipt, um, it basically gets 
the the text right it got the contents the core domain stuff right in our cart we've got list of products so our apis we return stream of product and we have a command method that adds a product and that's it um, we have this in total price that's a query method also uh, the int eventually we, we would change to money um, but everything else is but this is still pure domain right we see nothing in our imports we don't see any strings here so our cart is pure domain and then we've got tests against basically our cart that are also pure domain right we've got strings in the name of our products but that's just used to, to create a product what we're passing into the add method are these products and we could actually do a little refactoring on our on our test here we could say this is this is a constant why not just create a constant uh which method names are long you're talking about the test method names because those are not method names those are just names of tests so let's create this as a constant we'll call this toothbrush uh and then we'll create this as a constant and this is toothpaste so now it's a bit more clear that that we're really working at the domain level we're just adding products adding products checking price checking contents and, and so on So this is so um, FB dude mentioned that that names are long, and I'm again presuming you're talking about the tests. Um, and and I think it's a really important way to think about it that the method names here on domain objects and other objects, it's important to have them be concise. Right. In other words, not too long. If they're long, that's probably indicating that you haven't quite reached your abstraction. Um, but these are not method names. And this has nothing to do with naming in Java being verbose. I'm sorry. It has nothing to do with this. I would write test method names like this in any other language, because this is supposed to be explaining what this test does. Right. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've tested are often longer than this, right? When I add a toothbrush and the product type price is, is $1 empty cart is right. This is supposed to be communicating as much as possible what the intent of this test is. And so I actually don't think about these as method names because nobody calls them other than the, the unit test runner, which doesn't really count. Like none of your code calls this. So it serves a different purpose. You could just call this, you know, um, you know, first test and then put a display name to explain that this what this is doing maybe maybe you find that useful i i don't but it, it is sort of the intent behind it is that the method name is serving as the description of what is this what is this test doing right in kotlin you can just use the back tick and you can put spaces and all sorts of stuff in it yeah but given that um, we're working in, in Java with JUnit, this is uh, this is what we what we want to do. And let me go push this. Oh, I did push it. Great. Uh, so Wheatlell asks about the definition I use for object-oriented programming. Um, I don't know that there's a definition that's useful other than uh, because it gets gets a bit um, fractal. Like, so to me, object-oriented programming is where uh, objects are individually responsible for the behavior around information. 
and you communicate between now there's different so oop to me is like not everything in in the application is going to be oo to me everything inside the hexagon is oo um the stuff outside of it can or might not be that totally depends on the framework and all the things you're doing but it but where the domain is concerned that's where i want objects to be responsible for the behavior and the manipulation around information through commands and queries um you, you know so using encapsulation that's important uh commands and queries are important um thinking about behavior and not just information so i don't know if, if that's a great definition but that's the way i think about it Uh, I love coding. Uh, here's for the Jasmine R spec style test naming is regular strings, getting difficult, ugly in our preferred languages. Yeah. Uh, FP dude, is it true the prototype based OOP is original? OOP? Um, I don't know. I mean, you'd have to go back to like Simula. I mean, what do you call the first object oriented language? Is it Simula? Is it go back before then? Were those prototype based? I don't remember. Um, Smalltalk is sort of popularized OO. I don't think that's prototype based. But again, it's been a while since I've been thought about small talk. So for me, the object-oriented programming and design is critical for the, the inside of the hexagon, right? Our application, core domain, our domain stuff. Outside, it depends. I still want to keep stuff as object-oriented as possible, um, but... Uh, some of it might just be weirdly event-driven or procedural. Um, totally depends on, on the framework. You may have uh, data-only objects. So data transfer objects are important, and those don't abide by the same principle because they're just data. All right. Well, that's all for today. That's all I wanted to, to do for today was get um, basically do test-driven development of hexagonal architecture for the supermarket check out pricer exercise um if you want uh to see what we did this is the repo um that's actually the repo with the uh looking at the branch that we just were working on we work on the stream branch um the main branch is if you want to do this on your own and so the intent of this is not to just watch me do it um although uh, I love you for doing it, for watching me do it. Um, but the idea is to do it on your own. Um, go through the stories. How would you do it? What stories would you do next? Um, if you focus just more on, on the cart special deal behavior, where would that lead you? Uh, there was sort of a decision point in, you know, if we look at the commits, um, let's look at the commits. All right, basically when we... Um, had our basically our, our first failing test. I think it was around here, failing test for multiple items. Uh, it's at that point that we move the rendering on, on its own to a separate class to abide by hexagonal architecture. But here we could have decided to say, you know what, we'll worry about that later. Let's focus on getting that cart to work. Well, you could not be here, and then you, know, you wouldn't be watching. Um, or you could be here and not actively watching and just listening, and that's fine too. So this is sort of a decision point, and there were other sort of decision points where we could have gone a different direction. So I explicitly went from here, so everything here and here and later was was sort of with the hexagonal architecture in mind. We could have gone a different direction and again, focused on the cart and its special deals and, and sort of put to the side the whole thing around hexagonal. So it'd be interesting to do that as well. So uh, my website, um, ted.dev, I post articles. I'm currently uh, finishing up my series on the predictive test-driven development. So if you go to ted.dev, you'll, you'll see, this is my new websites that I've put up in the past month, and I'm basically trend, trends, transition migrated all my articles to here. Um, you can find out about joining my Discord. 
uh, which I encourage you to do if you want to discuss some, anything that came up during this stream. And um, that's it. So thanks, uh, thanks for hanging out. And um, I'll see you on the next stream where what we'll do is now that we've separated out a little bit of adapter versus core domain. Um, we'll start seeing what happens when we split the actual scanner from the printer. So what is the scanner doing? How does the add products come into our system? So we'll need to deal with the scanner part. And then should we really have a scanner printer? Maybe printer is some separate entity that we need to treat separately. Um, and so we'll split that out into a separate adapter. And I think that's where we'll take it next. All right. Thanks, folks. I will see you next time. Uh, have a good rest of your day.